Good evening, everyone. Good evening from LA and good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, welcome to panel nine of the webinar series, Indigenous Peoples, Heritage and Landscape in the Asia Pacific, Knowledge Co-Production, Policy Change and Empowerment. Before we start, um, we would like to acknowledge that as a land grant institution, the Department of Anthropology, Center for Southeast Asian Studies and Asia Pacific Center at UCLA acknowledges the Gabrieleno Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, Los Angeles Basin and the Southern Channel Islands. We are grateful for the support of the Wenner Grant Foundation for Anthropological Research through the webinars on the Future of Anthropology Grant, the Henry Luce Foundation, the New England University for People First People's Rights Center, the National Chenji University Center for Taiwan, Philippines, Indigenous Knowledge, Local Knowledge, and Sustainable Studies, or City Pills, the UCLA Kotzen Institute of Archaeology, and the UCLA Asia Pacific Center. This panel is co sponsored by the Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Organization, the Semia Spafa, or uh, Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Organization, Regional Center for Archaeology and Fine Arts, or Simeo Spafa. The UCLA Department of Anthropology, UCLA Center for Southeast Asian Studies, the University of Hawaii at Manoa Center for Southeast Asian Studies, Ifugao State University, the Partido State University, and the Save the Ifugao Terrorist Movement are co-hosts of the webinar series. I am Stephen Acabado, a, uh, an assist, uh, associate professor of anthropology at UCLA and the co-convener of these uh, webinar series. My colleague, um, Professor Dawei Kwan of NCCU, will um, uh, provide a brief back background of this panel. Hi, Stephen and everyone. Good morning from Taiwan. Um, it's my honor to introduce you this panel. As we know, Southeast Asia traditional textile are world renowned and valued as expression of cultural identity from the weaving and dyeing process to the symbolic of their aesthetic and use. However, local knowledge and actual method to preserve such deterioration from organ organic material is an, an understudied field. To identify in tropical climate appropriate locally sourced sustainable and cost effective method that can be adopted by local practition, practitioners working in the preservation of traditional textile. Simil Safa collect collaboratively with local collaborated with local researchers on the region wide project to collect document and compile invaluable indigenous knowledge on car caring for textile. Data collected included plant materials, a method for weight cleaning, dry cleaning, stain removal, insect mitigation, storage, and associate, associated spiritual beliefs. A first study of its kind is brought together a dynamic group of textile professional, museum expert, conserva conservators, historian, scientist, and anthropologist, are eager to research, chronicle, and learn more about their own national and indigenous practice before the knowledge is lost. So I would like to invite our um, Mady to further introduce our panelists and uh, moderator today. Maybe. Thank you, Professor Daya. My name is Madeline Yakel. I'm a graduate student at UCLA, and today I'll be introducing our panelists and our moderator for panel 10 of the uh, panel nine, sorry, of the webinar series. Lillian Garcia Alonso Alba is professor and co-chief of the Laboratory of Traditional and Sustainable Technologies for Conservation and coordinator of the scientific access for the master's program at the National School of Conservation, Restoration, and Museography, NCRIM. Her focus is traditional 
technologies and materials researcher with technical studies in laboratory science. As a professor, she aims to generate interest in the rescue and appreciation of cultural and traditional heritage as a non-toxic, safe, and necessary alternative in contemporary restoration. She has a BA in Art Conservation, MA in Social Studies, and PhD in Mesoamerican Studies. Lillian has contributed to publications and workshops in biology, physics, and conservation for the American Institute of Conservation, um, also for the International Committee for Museums and Collections of Science and Technology, and the International Council of Museums, and UNESCO, and Getty Institute, and Simio Spafa, the National Autonomous University of Mexico, the Universidad Iberoamericana, the Autonomous University, Universities of Morelos and Michoacan, and the North American Textile Conservation Conference. Julia M. Brennan is founder of Caring for Textiles, and she has worked in the field of textile conservation since 1985. She is committed to conservation outreach and the protection of cultural property and providing stakeholders with sustainable skills. Since 2000, she has led multiple conservation workshops in Bhutan, Madagascar, Algeria, Indonesia, Laos, and Thailand, Cambodia, Taiwan, and Rwanda in museums, monasteries, genocide memorials, and community-based collections. Julia has a BA from Columbia University and a master's in art crime from the Association for Research in Crimes Against Art. Anissa M. Gultam is director Director of Ras Al Khaimah National Museum, United, United Arab Emirates, where she works with local Emirati communities developing rotating heritage ex exhibitions for the ethnography and archaeology wings. As a BA archaeology student, Universitas Indonesia, her focus was tangible material culture. Her subsequent Fulbright Fellowship, an MA in Museum Communications, University of the Arts, Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, USA built on community engagement initiatives. She launched community focused group discussions as part of a museum master plan and feasibility project at a provincial museum in West Papua in 2012, one of the several Indonesian government supported museum re revitalization projects since 2010. She was a key partner developing the museum kind of traditional cloth in Bali with an emphasis on the intersection of indigenous knowledge and pub public programming, as well as extensive documentation of Southeast Asian traditional cloth. She continues to be actively involved with cultural network initiatives in Asia and Europe with great interest in museum decolonization. Majnurul bin Abghani is curator at the Division of Research and Documentation Department of Museums Malaysia, Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Cultural Malaysia. He has curated several exhibitions, including Batik by the Yard, Design and Innovation, 1960s to 1990s, Batik Sarong, A Legacy for Today and Tomorrow, and a World, Cost and a World Costume Dolls, Dolls exhibition. He co-curated with Chetna Bhatt, Zandra Rhodes, A Lifelong Love Affair with Textiles, and with Japan design journalists, Noriko Kawakami, the exhibition, Japan Handmade, designed from Kyoto, the collection of Masataka Hoso and Toro Tuji. Charo's research is based on textiles, costume, fashion, and culture, especially in Batik Malaysia's industry. His museum career began as a curator, Department of Museum and Antiquity, 2004 to 2009, followed by curator to the Army Museum in Port Dixon under Ministry of Defense Malaysia, 2009 to 2011. From 2011 to 2018, he worked at the National Textile Museum until his current position at the Department of Museums Malaysia. Our moderator today is Lynn Ann Moreau. Um, she is Program Officer at the Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Organization Regional Center for Archaeology and Fine Arts, or CMO SPAFA. Her focus is on strategic planning and overseeing projects in archaeology, arts, and heritage, with an emphasis on promoting the symbiotic relationship between nature and culture and exploring the values of indigenous knowledge for sustainable development. A Royal Society of the Arts Fellow, her interests include how heritage and traditional wisdom of indigenous communities, in particular Southeast Asian sea nomads, work in tandem with the environment. She has a BA and MA in Southeast Asian Studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies 
and an MA in Information and Communication at the University from Paris Sorbonne Nouvelle. Previous work experience includes the Asia Society Texas Center, the UN Assistance to the Khmer Rouge Trials, at the Center for Khmer Studies, and the French Research Center on Contemporary Southeast Asia. And so with that, I'd like to turn the floor over to our moderator, Lynn N. Rowe, for Panel 9. Uh, thank you, Maddie, for the introduction. Thank you, Dawei, for outlining our panel, and thank you, Stephen. Um, on behalf of Simeo Spapa, we would like to welcome our viewers and to thank UCLA and the Wendell Grant Foundation for supporting this webinar series. Um, so Dawei actually introduced uh, this research very well, mentioning that the study that we're about to, to talk about today um, brought together a group of dynamic textile professionals, uh, museum experts, conservators, art historians, anthropologists who were eager to research, record um, their, um, their indigenous practices before the knowledge is lost. Now, this research project had about um, 20 researchers from across Southeast Asia conducting local research, and uh, four of us are joining us today from across the world. And Maddie already introduced their backgrounds very well, so thank you for that, Maddie. Um, so maybe I'm gonna start with um, Julia, who has been with the project since 2013 and is actually responsible for moving it forward. And uh, maybe she could tell us what this research is about and summarize the findings for us. Uh, Julia, could you put your mic on please? <laughs> Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, Lynn, you can put up a slide. Um, this research started primarily because I have been teaching textile conservation and care of uh, collections in Southeast Asia and for um, about six or seven years in Thailand, based at the Queen Sarikit Museum of Textiles in Bangkok. And between there and Laos and Cambodia and even Bhutan, over the years, I've learned that um, I've been exporting Western conservation knowledge and realizing that there is a lot to be learned from the actual traditions that exist in each place where we are trying to preserve the materials. And so it was really, this whole effort was fueled by my own interest to try and bring together all of the stakeholders to really uh, explore and start to learn and study their own cultures, understand the textiles. Many people I work with have are urban based and they're somewhat disconnected from their from their villages or from you know their their mother home. Um, but urging people to go home and learn more about their own traditions has the, opened up a whole world of knowledge. Um, that isn't something you necessarily learn in structured school. So it was an effort to really try to bring local knowledge, indigenous information um, into the field of conservation and preventive conservation, textile conservation in particular, and search for traditional methods and solutions and um, actual um, remedies to try and um, implement conservation that would be locally based and sustainable. And in the next slide, you'll see that, you know, we combine um, interviews in the field. Um, our work was first based on a pilot project in Thailand with Spafa Simeo. And Lynn, you can advance to the next slide or should I do it? You can do it. Um, uh, our, our pilot project was based in, in Northern Thailand, Pre, which Simeo Spafa had had quite a lot of work with before in both indigo dyeing and local architecture and, and other projects within the community. So the community was already um, engaged with researchers. There was a group of people, there was a sense of trust and exchange of information and knowledge among 
both outside researchers from Thailand and the community. And so it made a lot of sense to start our pilot project there. And we expanded it then to some of the weaving villages of the Queen of Thailand, which also had a, a predetermined um, sense of trust for our group of researchers. And from there, we, we, did, we conducted interviews and collected actual data about the plants that are used to clean and to do stain removal, to try and keep insects away, um, and um, also methods for storage, and also all of the spiritual beliefs and perhaps um, you know, superstitions and things that go with the care of textiles. And it was a remarkable amount of data that we came up with. And based on that, we decided to then take the project across Southeast Asia, um, it, again, in partnership with Simeo Spafa, um, identifying the partners. Um, Lynn, can we advance the slide? I don't think I can do it myself. Can you move the slide along? Lynn? Can we go to the next slide? Yeah. For some reason, I can't move it. To the next slide. Um, I don't, I'm sorry, but I would like to advance the slides and I don't seem to have the capacity. Yes, yeah, so so, I'm, I'm, I'm moving the slides around, um, but we oh, are, you are. Yeah, so it should, right now I'm on the plants that were identified. Okay. I'm, I'm not seeing it. The, okay, I'll just uh, carry on though. I can't see the slides. Um, so we identified 62 plants and in, put into databases and the work was done through these 10 countries, organized with researchers, three of who were, are with on our panel tonight, um, collecting not only plant data, but also recipes and actual plants and interviewing a minimum of 10 people and then compiling that data into country reports with the goal of then bringing everyone together for some regional meetings specifically um, to share knowledge, but also to test some of the plant-based recipes against some of the chemical um, recipes and cleaners that we've traditionally used in the West for textile conservation. So a way to take this indigenous knowledge and then put it up uh, into an actual scientific analysis and testing and see how successful it is compared to the chemical treatments. And what we found was that among all of these different, 60 different um, plants that were identified, more than 60% are no longer used, but they are collected and remembered, particularly by older, older um, interviewees. So it's a kind of retrospective knowledge that was, that was presented and, and recalled by people. And different countries had more indigenous knowledge available. Um, in places like Singapore, it was quite difficult to find local communities that used any kind of plant-based materials or even recalled them. So um, I think Overall, what we learned was that there is a group of elders, um, and which is why we say before, you know, before it's gone, there's a group of elders uh, who still retain this knowledge and we're very, very uh, happy to share both the information and the plants and the recipes and, and pass this information on to the next generation. And so it was through these interactions that we were able to gather this data and put together a really, really formidable groups of plant databases in multiple languages and the country reports and then draw conclusions and do analysis and testing. And that's how it was brought together. So since I wasn't really following slides, I hope that that what I said sort of matched what you were seeing on the screen. I mean, we, among 62 plants identified, it was everything from uh, lots of herbs and things you might use in the kitchen, pandan leaves, peppers, cloves, tobacco leaves. Many things seem to be just sort of a, a kind of kitchen wisdom. But the interesting thing is that 
if they're used properly, they can work. Um, and they dovetail beautifully with the whole concept of preventive conservation and integrated pest management, for example, which requires um, daily regular checking and not the use of chemicals, but the use of human ingenuity and, and patience and monitoring and observation um, in order to take better care of collections, particularly textiles. Uh, th thank you very much, Julie. I'm sorry, I've been having trouble managing the slides. I've been trying to put it into a uh, desktop version, but uh, thank you for uh, very clearly outlining what we've been doing in this research. Um, and um, I would like to maybe talk, uh, move on to Shah for a bit, because you mentioned how the importance of reaching out to the local community when you were talking about reaching out to PRE and reaching out to um, the, the Queen's communities with pre-established trust. And so when we engaged the, the researchers, um, maybe Sha, you could tell us about where you conducted your research and how you conducted your research. Hello. Hi. Uh, okay. Um, speaking about reaching the prisoners uh, about uh, my research, I'm, could that, I'm sorry, it's a bit dark here. It's because I am having blackout <laughs> in my office now. <laughs> so bad like that. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> hey, you still can. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, actually, it's a, uh, I'm reaching the uh, respondents uh, by uh, my personal uh, networks, actually, from my family and uh, also uh, from colleagues that from the museum itself. And as I believe it's, uh, it's, at the first time, it's challenging to find out uh, who is the best res uh, responder that we need to, to, to include in, in, in this research. So what we need, I'm having a discussion with my uh, colleagues first, that we is suitable to, 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 to be a, a respondent. To, to answer all those questions and to give the uh, at least uh, a traditional recipes to uh, to this research, and then the, and when I uh, planning out and I call my mom itself and uh, talk to her and suddenly um, uh, she um, surprised uh, about this kind of uh, research that I. Uh, conducted uh, together with uh, Spafa. I say, uh, they say, she say, um, uh, my grandmother is also uh, using that before because uh, she is a kind of the uh, shamans uh, in the in the fa in the in the big family in a, in the in a, in the village. So, and the same time they uh, she she gave me the advice and who to talk and uh, to refer to. Which one, which person uh, who who are capable to to give the the information about the recipes? Okay, and then um, I search a uh, few. If if uh, maybe we can go to the look to the area. Uh, Leanna, uh, uh, my slide, please. <laughs> Yeah, and I have a few networkings there uh, where I have uh, friends, museum friends, also um, family, including family and those colleagues and a few viewers that I, I, I need to interview. So most of the dams uh, actually is a confusing about the, those, uh, the recipe, the old recipe, because they are not uh, uh, practicing anymore since um, since uh, they believe uh, they uh, the traditional method haven't been uh, appreciated anymore. So the young generations doesn't continuously uh, to 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 interest to have interest 
on this kind of matter because of the uh, of the um, uh, commercials, uh, soups, comings, and everything uh, is modern. And uh, and maybe because of the mandate of the uh, government itself, uh, looking for the technology and uh, something that uh, uh, Westerners produce, Western produ produce. So they they could. Uh, uh, a bit confused at the moment to 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 to, to get, but um, yes, to drive uh, from uh, Kuala Lumpur to Kelantan to, to the East Coast uh, to the East Coast is a bit uh, uh, because they are most of the most of the dam is uh, uh, especially the weavers who's living in a very uh, deep area uh, nearby the rivers or everything, and uh, to get the. Uh, I choose actually a three stakes there. It's a Kelantan and Terengganu and Pahang because I, I believe uh, this uh, this three stakes is still uh, genuinely having uh, uh, keeping a secret uh, from uh, uh, keeping a secret in the Dia village. By personal touch, uh, uh, I need to go through. Uh, uh, be uh, like uh, to know them um, in uh, in because of the friends and family, and they are they are suddenly giving uh, uh, one one willing to uh, to share their opinions and to share to re to recall back all the recipes that uh, uh, that is is almost gone, but so they are just remind them themselves. Uh, re, uh, recall them say, by, by what, what they have practiced before. So, uh, and uh, I suddenly found uh, that it's very interesting. Uh, there is uh, the words wukuk in the Kelantan is very, uh, wukuk is uh, using the chicken trap. I think uh, Julia's, okay, it's very clear now. Okay, uh, with using the chicken track, a smoke, uh, smoke, um, with the smoking, smoking textile, te uh, smoking technique to the textile, it comes to, uh, it comes to the, the, the idea. It's a, it, it, uh, when, when we talk about this, it's a dry cleaning method, it is a smoke, uh, with the satangi, it's in spinner. I think, uh, the, yes, uh, that, that, in, in the in the slide now there is a wuku we call it in Kelantan wuku yeah I, I just found it from a, a few friends and uh, an expertise in textile too and uh, to be back uh, to hometown to get a trust from them um, is kind of challenging a little bit uh, because they are uh, never get the clear pictures uh, uh, of those recipes. Yeah, they, they are just uh, asking me to, to, to refer to others and others to complete the, all the recipes. So uh, maybe, maybe someone have a, having a techniques, but they are forgetting about the ingredient itself. So they are trying to combine Together, uh, we when we talk, uh, we sometimes I I are giving a call when I'm interview one each other, calling to to another respondent to together together to get the uh, confirmations about the recipes. I think uh, yes. Uh, yeah, thank you, Shah. I'm just going to interject. You were talking about the method of the chicken trap. So I think now on the screen, uh, viewers can see what you're talking about. You can see the image of uh, the late Ibu Nora Gunawan, who is uh, using the exact method that you're describing of uh, smoking the textile on top of the chicken trap with the setangi incense or ratus, they would call it in Indonesia. Uh, which is a which acts as an effective uh, fumigant for textiles. So I mean, now that the picture is up, I thought it would be good for viewers to kind of understand and and visualize um, how this is done. And uh, 
also the, the ingenuity behind it and how it's a, uh, a safe way to protect your textile from, uh, from pests and it won't affect it with stains or, or anything. So sorry, yeah, I just wanted to interject with that so that people can see. And uh, now that your uh, slides are up, I think it's, um, it's wonderful to show um, all of these people who, who, were, who were involved in your research and that you reached out to, to your family. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, kind of you, you approached people, they were a little bit confused about, about why you were asking these questions. Um, we actually uh, in, encountered something, uh, something similar when we did our, our research in prayer in Northern Thailand. Uh, we approached uh, Kun, uh, Kun Jan, who was part of the Karen community in Northern Thailand. And when we asked questions um, like, um, uh, like how do you um, treat this textile if it's, uh, if it's stained or um, it needs to be repaired? And they just looked at us a little bit with bewilderment and said, well, you just weave a new one. I mean, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, but and then we just have these these fun interactions, sharing with people, and uh, yes, and and you know, all these women they know they know how to weave. They've known how to weave since uh, since since they were teenagers, um, and so so yes, that's great that you've told us about um, your your research process and where you drew the information from, how that happened, and now. Um, Afterwards, once you had this information, um, what did you, uh, what, how did you share it afterwards? Okay, it's, it's, uh, it's actually is uh, to, to, to sustain this kind of uh, heritage uh, to, be, to be gone like this. So I, I, I made a decision uh, to sharing this is, uh, with uh, conducting an experimental workshop. Uh, uh, at first, uh, by with uh, together with the uh, museum colleagues in the museum itself, and uh, stay in the discussions and stay uh, uh, try to find the exactly amounts of each uh, uh, herbs and or ingredient and put it together in the uh, slide. It's like it's like smoking uh, a dry cleaning method with the smoked. It's a satangi. Uh, we do not know exactly. Uh, maybe in the in the in the scientifically, we 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 know how much, uh, how many milligram, how many gram that do we, how many milligram that do we put together to to, to burn it. Uh, uh, in it. But in the traditional way, they just they just uh, follow their instincts only. Uh, it, 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 it kind of uh, to to it's not easy to get an understand how much, but. but when we try, we, we try to do it uh, uh, experimental. We we try to separate a few a few groups uh, from, uh, and uh, we try to add on. Uh, we measure every each, uh, the ingredient itself. Then, and we tried another method. Uh, maybe uh, some uh, some uh, some ingredients as uh, local ingredients is like akawani is a. Chitrona, chitronella roots. It's not easy to get it because you need a, you need a, a, you need a long process to dry it out. So what we what we choose, um, we uh, we try to the process. We 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 try the uh, akawani at least uh, one weeks, and uh, and uh, we have another ingredient. Put it together, and uh, when uh, we separate the three groups. Uh, like, like 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 three groups, it, it, it gives a, a, a difference difference uh, uh, result. Uh, means it comes from uh, like um, uh, a first group. It could be more perfuming. Second group is a more uh, uh, feeling uh, a bit uh, just a mind, and the third group is a, is a bit uh, feel. Uh, Having a spicy, a spice in the in the in the in the, in the. and then the I I from the result every issue of the material I, I using the batik clothes actually to 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 avoid the damage to other now just just uh, just a batik cloth only and uh, I couldn't find any stains and uh, in the in the in the textile itself 
And uh, when I story in a uh, nearby, uh, in some place, uh, it could be not to, I'm not sure, maybe uh, not to attract the, 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 the pest itself, especially when I, um, it's just, just small, small, small experiments, but it's still, still going on. But I just confused because they, 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 they put, uh, uh, because in the, ingre in, the ingre in, the ingre in the ingredient itself, you have uh, uh, sugar, uh, uh, sugar from uh, uh, sugar. Uh, it's like uh, we, you can see the in the in the pictures here. Uh, there, there is sugar. We call the sugar uh, cane sugar. It's a raw cane sugar. Uh, add on together in the, in this in the, in this recipe. So I'm not sure it, it can be attract the pests or not, especially the ants. And um, so uh, it's a bit really exciting experience. And they they those people is a big, uh, especially from uh, most of the them is a is a museum um, uh, staff, a uh, museum a colleagues a museum staff, and uh, a people who are uh, who are activity active in the in the heritage so they are uh, feeling shocked with this kind of uh, uh, technique because they never get any any idea or any information about this kind of uh, recipes before from Italy until uh, when I, I, I started conducting and uh, uh, experimental workshop. It's it's really it's really enjoy enjoyable because uh, because uh, it's a good step for a museum conservations to have a local products. I mean a local uh, material. And then it, it less uh, it give a less cost on the, our music industry. So the local products that can you can buy in in the market. In, but you can you can you can you can plan by yourself uh, nearby the museums itself. So and in and I think it's a very good things because uh, I believe uh, it's good for environmental too. So um, uh, yes, as you said, these are these are great uh, solutions that are environmentally friendly. And it's, uh, it's really great that you've been sharing this knowledge with your museum community and your colleagues and that you've been conducting all these experiments um, to put them to use and to, to, va to validate their, um, their effectiveness. Um, so how, how are, your, uh, are your colleagues enthusiastic about using these methods? And um, so are, they gonna, are they gonna be kind of institutionalized in textile conservation at the Department of Museums Malaysia? We uh, actually we are uh, stay stay in a uh, uh, to get approved. To, we try. Uh, uh, it's a, actually it's a leading for further research because we 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 never testing exactly to the, our uh, to 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 the the collections of the collection, but we you we just using the just another experimental um, material. Uh, it's like batik. At the moment, so if this kinds just uh, just maybe for the storage, uh, we 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 are using for a few things that storage, uh, perfuming. We are still, uh, but but in the we need to uh, monitor them uh, uh, quietly. Uh, uh, we we have a schedules to uh, to to every every time. But this is uh, this is considered still. Still on the on the on, on ongoing, um, but we try to uh, knowing what the exactly time to to change every each uh, uh, plants material that because every uh, because I, I got uh, advice from uh, conservators itself uh, some material can can. Can give a good impact to to 
to to to kill uh, to 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 banish the the the, the insects uh, the pests but but they can be invited others uh, pests coming to the storage so um, uh, it's a, a long way to go to 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 confirm that uh, these traditional methods can be used. Uh, uh, in the museums, because we are a bit confusing and a bit uh, uh, not so much confidence like the old elderly people did before. So I, I'm just wondering why my great great grandmother has stored their uh, very uh, very precious textile in the in the in the box where they put it together with the flowers and uh, and and the herbs together but uh, maybe uh, because of the young generations uh, never get uh, exactly um, the, the matter is not continuously so maybe we are a bit confusing and a bit uh, in, in, in paranoid to, 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 to have that to follow that the all the all uh, recipes to in the modern worlds now so yeah, to, to, to connect between the old generations and the, and the young generations is not much easier because we are separately by the technology itself. So some young generations believe they, they, they need to follow uh, the laboratory uh, uh, technicals uh, uh, what, uh, theoric, uh, theorically uh, from the westernized dance. So um, auntie, we are forget uh, uh, the old generations, and then the, the old generation also uh, uh, is a little bit confusing and um, uh, yeah, feeling 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 uh, untrusty to to give the past uh, what they have it to to young generation because maybe the uh, the young generation can copy so well so. To have to have the connections, I, I I'm I, I'm in the middle now to 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 make the young generations now uh, to to confidence what the elderly people done before. So, and uh, to get a tries from the elderly people is takes time uh, to maybe in the future I will be invite them to to the museum itself how how the the laboratory modern laboratory uh, works. So let's let's the uh, the uh, scientific uh, and the traditional matter combine together. Uh, I I I'm very I I'm very um, glad that 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 Spafa and and uh, and uh, and Julia and uh, Lilians uh, comes together on this, and that that's me as something a good for music industry itself, because. Of course, museum. Uh, we try to reduce the cost of uh, taking off uh, our our material culture itself. So, because uh, yes, to to taking care of the material culture, culture it, it very costly every year. Yeah, we spend a lot. We we don't want to spend a lot of our money for for. We we try to reduce. We try to balance it. What what because. You know, they follow the mandate of the government itself. What 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 the exactly Malaysian wants wants uh, uh, in their life, in daily life. If if they want the museum or the material culture uh, can be up in the in 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 this to 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 sustain in the in the in the culture in the heritage, then uh, they 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 will, they will love to be put the effort to effort. Uh, to work together to help us uh, to take care of the material culture itself. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Al, for for sharing how you did your research. Um, I'll I'll never forget when you uh, when we had the regional forum in Bangkok, and you actually pulled up this slide and showed all the people that you reached out to in your in your personal networks, which is uh, which was so refreshing to see. Um, and where and where you got where you sourced all of this invaluable knowledge that's uh, environmentally friendly and uh, so while we're on the topic of uh, of a community um, a community uh, community research and um, and environment and landscape 
I would like to move over to Anissa. Um, maybe if you could tell us, Anissa, if you could tell us where you conducted your research, what you found and how the community felt about it, summarize how it went in a nutshell, um, that would be great. Thank you, Anissa. Thank you, Lynn. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Um, Lynn, can you help me with my slide? Where is it? Yes, yeah, sure, no problem. I can do that. So, <laughs> all right, there we go. Okay. So, yeah. So, we, um, this is a, a quite interesting research um, because, well, my background was uh, is archaeology, but uh, when I, uh, during my tenure working in the Kain Museum, Kain means cloth in Bali, uh, I discover actually new things, living tradition and then the community and how the community uh, values cloth because in Bali, um, they still, uh, I mean, the, 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 the tradition of wearing cloth is still very much a daily use. So uh, for them, it's just, you know, uh, regular, like, oh, okay, this one traditional. We, as, as researcher, we see it, oh, this is traditional, this is contemporary. For them, it's just cloth. It's like, it's, it's just part of their identity and their part of their daily wear because when they do the, the daily pray, they have to wear cloth, men and uh, male and female, they have to wear it. So at least they will wear this, um, uh, uh, their traditional cloth at least uh, two to three times a day. So uh, my, you see in my first slide, this is kind of like the conclusion of my research at the time is that we don't always wash our clothes. So. Um, let's let's uh, let's see first uh, Bali. Uh, you know, I mean, everyone knows Bali more than the country of Indonesia. Sometimes um, Bali is amazing because it's uh, it's still ninety percent uh, Hindu beliefs among seventeen thousand islands of a country that is actually ninety percent uh, Muslim. And so the tradition are still alive. They don't really see what, what is the past, what is now, but it's just seeing it how um, um, aspect of the material culture is just part of their daily life and some things are left behind, but some of them are still remembering. You can see in this map, these are the regions in, in Bali uh, that they make cloth. So different areas in Bali, they make different kind of cloth and they have their own self identity and self ownership and their own styles and the making methods that they have uh, they are mostly uh with the ikat uh, method and a weaving method but then there's also the batik method you see this man is stamping um the wax to do the uh the 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 diarosis technique of batik, and this lady uh, with the with the with the brush is brushing wax on uh, on an indigo dyed cloth. Uh, so the batik method comes a bit later because the original uh, original methods are with ikat and when and, we, and weaving um, because that's actually the the majority of cloth making traditional in Indonesia. Batik is just because it was in Java, I was kind of like um, the dominant power since the seventh century. So a lot of the trade and everything actually brought batik more faster uh, throughout the archipelago. Um, and as you see, uh, these batik methods also used by a more kind of contemporary development of the traditional made cloth in Bali. And then the material and the dye uh, that they use. Um, so because these are uh, mostly uh, ikat and weaving methods, so they dyed the, the threads. Uh, as you can see, this um, uh, the the one with the purple and yellow color. These are a combination of a, an already dyed um, thread and metal thread. So they also have they also involve metal threads in their weavings. 
but they are also uh, involving material like um, this cotton in this guy's hand. They have two kinds of cotton, the white color and the already kind of faint uh, brown color. So um, they, they use this also. And um, they also use natural dye, but in limited, in limited number for now because there's a demand of, continuous demand of, uh, continuous and larger demand of making more cloth. So, uh, so it's only in limited areas. And there are some part that um, produce indigo, but this in limited area, but this is something that I will talk about a bit later. Now, on the next slide, you will see, this is, this is just a, like a, a, a small picture of like the larger um, usage of, 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 their, of cloth in, in Balinese uh, daily life. So they have their daily prayer, they have, uh, they have the wedding, they have the big ceremonies, and then they have the temple birthdays. So if you are a, a small family, you have your small family temple, you have your uh, bigger clan temple, and then you have your village temple, and then you have uh, the um, uh, the island temple, and every temple have their own birthday, and every birthday have this digit ritual. So it's like, uh, you know, a, a very rich kind of schedule of, of wearing cloth as part of your ritual and in your daily life so for them it's just still very natural so the demand of of cloth in bali is very large so sometimes they uh to have to have more access like to cheaper cloth or faster they make copies of the traditional ones uh, with like a more uh um, mass produced uh, methods, but they still keep the ones that are um, uh, with using traditional cloth, and they don't always wear it. So, uh, like you see the one on the bottom right, these ladies with the with the with the crowns. So they are wearing this kind of um, uh, Balinese style weaving, and that um, uh, having a kind of like a, a red brownish color, and there's a treatment for the the thread before they start the weaving to apply some kind of oil and uh, and then mix it with and then it will later on kind of like uh, um, like uh, processing with the dye so it's kind of like increase the color of the the red color and this application of of sweat uh, sorry application of oil uh, they see this it can actually maintain the color. So what they do, they don't really wash it very often, this kind of cloth. What they do, they like to wear it and then air it and then put it back in their, um, um, in their uh, uh, cabinet. And maybe they will use like a, like cloth or, or, or pepper to kind of may, uh, maintain the dryness. But uh, they have a belief uh, the more you wear it, the more the sweat from your body kind of maintain this lively red color of the dye, just like how they use this kind of different kind of oil when they treat the, they treat the, the thread. So that's what they do with their original um, uh, um, weaving cloths. And uh, in some of the we can see the next slide. In some of the resource persons that I interview, so we have three groups of uh, resource persons, that's the users and collectors, and then the makers, and then the experts. So from, the, from all of this, they have a memory of uh, using uh, kind of like a larak that uh, being used to clean batik, uh, but uh, the, the, this kind of um, method is used from their grandmother's um, generation, and it's not uh, easy, widely used anymore. They don't really; it's not really popular. It's not easy to 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 get the material. What they do now is not uh, it's is uh, is uh, like what I said. They don't really wash their cloth, and this is a. This is a, a, an understanding that I receive either 
from the user and collectors and also the expert. Some of the makers, they give um, specific direction in, in, depending on the materials. Uh, there's even one of the maker, a few of the makers uh, kind of suggest if you really, really have to clean the stain, use a very soft um, kind of soap, like uh, like a, a dishwashing soap. So it's, it's more softer than the, than the regular um, detergent, you know, and uh, uh, another finding that I found in this research is uh, uh, my interaction in one of the experts. Uh, there's this uh, chief village in, in Pejeng. This is a village in, in Ubud, uh, one of the uh, rich cultural heritage in the area because uh, literally when you dig a place in, in this, when you dig the ground in this village, you will find statues from like 13th century or 15th century. So it's it's a rich cultural heritage place. And this uh, village chief, his name is Pat Chok. He, um, he focused, that guy, yeah, very charismatic guy. And he focused on developing the, the indigo that was once uh, part of the Balinese um, traditional cloth making. Now the thing is with with indigo. If we can see the last slide, um, Lynn, indigo is basically something blue, right? So to make this blue color, you have to have the uh, you have to have the indigo plants, and you have to have a lot because you have to mix it, and then you have to wait to, to ferment it, and it smells really strong, and um, and it, it's like you have to maintain this chain of supply of the material so what he did not just uh, beyond uh sorry uh not just beyond um uh, in, in, uh creating innovation through the design uh with the batik method he also then worked with the community to start uh reviving lands that are not very productive in agriculture he started planning uh planting the indigo plant like it's a, it's a collaborative um, effort with the local village in bali and also in nusa panida island so this created a kind of like a new um like a, like a, a a chain like a cycle that it maintains something traditional that is slightly contemporary but uh he created with the villagers like a whole other environment behind it and and support the continuous uh development of it so um as an as an archaeologist that is kind of still a new and undoing anthropology stuff uh in, in 2016 these are something really like exciting because you see there's this kind of continuous um understanding or like the continuous um, adoption of traditional values, sense of aesthetic and, you know, keeping things alive, but also developing things to become something like new or, or innovative. So um, I think this is, this is just, just really exciting. I mean, thank you so much for involving me on, on this uh, research. It was, it was really, really enlightening for me. Um, thank you so much, Anissa, for uh, for sharing with us uh, all um, everything about. Um, I, I think you really put in a nutshell um, what cloths mean to the Balinese and how it's made, um, and how and how they preserve these heritage. And I think what you what you've talked about in in uh, how this indigo community, for example, have been reviving this heritage. Um, the repercussions have been amazing, and uh, in uh, for, for the creative economy of the village. Uh, that's one thing. And also in how it regenerated the landscape. So here you have this like regenerative cycle of where intangible knowledge meets uh, creative economy, meets material culture, meets preservation and revival of the landscape. Um, so a, a huge takeaway here I see is how this indigo community in Bali has its own ecosystem of, uh, of knowledge and landscape and material culture uh, through uh, the making of these textiles and through the, produ through the production, through preserving them. 
and through preserving this knowledge. So, um, and this really fits into the broader context of this webinar, how this, these are all linked, the cultural heritage with natural heritage. And um, so with all of these being intertwined, how do you see the future of these cultural and natural ecosystems is the one in Bali and others that you know of in your that you've encountered in your work under threat? Are they undergoing a revival or transformation? Have you seen anything, um, in, even in your everyday life, where you see these uh, things um, kind of coming back to life? Uh, well, um, um, in my short experience in the world of um, you know textile community-based textile in indonesia i don't really see a lot that kind of um, as striving and as um, uh, you know in a complete cycle as this indigo uh, community in in beijing bali because a lot of them uh, sometimes um there there are some um the issues like uh there are some groups that try to who try to revive uh, weaving cloth from the eastern part of Indonesia, like from Timor, from Sumba, or Nusa Tenggara. There is a problem of um, disconnection because it's on the other smaller Sunda islands, which is in the eastern, and the trans transportation system are not fully developed there. So when the transportation is not quite developed everything becomes more expensive right so uh, there are really great efforts like um uh, uh there's one foundation in 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 bali that they actually have a team of anthropologists who would go to these villages in the eastern part of indonesia and they go to get to see weavers who actually make the original original motifs and then um these take like months for them to 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 get to to know the weavers to to reach to them and then finally get the product and once the product reach their store in bali the the costs are already very very high so i see for my side there is a concern of we need to kind of preserve this um this somewhat dying tradition but we can't really afford it. So a lot of this kind of initiative, they aim the market to, to higher uh, economy level or international uh, international tourists, which is for me kind of creating an, a different kind of concern. Okay, now we are, we are maintaining this, preserving this, but then eventually it's only be, become part of a smaller portion of the society. Do you know what I mean? Like um, there is, uh, if you know, there's the original uh, batik with the with the with the painting method with the or with the stamp method, and as the batik made with the with the uh, mass produce, you know, printed batik. The 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 existence of the printed batik because there's a, a large demand of this batik because it since the 70s it became part of our uniforms it became so uh, like the national uh, formal wear and everything but people cannot afford a uh, cloth with the um the old method but they still have to have it so uh this it's um i mean it's it's just i guess it's just how naturally things works but it worries me a bit on how the other initiative hasn't been able to produce something that people can actually afford. I mean, Indonesian people can actually afford. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Anissa. Um, in, indeed, you know, um, mass production and, uh, and tourism, um, of course, have an effect on these, uh, on these activities. Um, and then, I mean, while, while you're here, I'd like to jump to something a little bit more controversial, but I think is extremely relevant in this global climate when we're talking about decolonizing knowledge, uh, decolonizing museums and scholarship. Um, in fact, when we, were, when we were planning this project from the very beginning, um, we were kind of concerned about when we were going to collect this knowledge, could it be exploited for commercial gain? Um, I don't know if you remember for the regional forum, for, for example, you brought the batik attack 
which, <laughs> um, and um, so on the one hand, this commercialization could potentially contribute to these plants making a comeback and, you know, they, they have their obvious values for sustainability. They provide opportunities for farming, just as you've shown with, um, with the indigo community in Bali. On the other hand, when you have this mass commercialization or this tourism and all of that, um, there comes with it uh, sometimes a loss of ownership. So as an activist in decolonizing museum scholarship and practices, how do you feel about how this traditional knowledge is used? Um, about a week ago, I was in a, I was moderating this webinar on open data on hacking your culture and um, uh, putting your cultural data out there. And we were discussing about the same topic. I mean, it's not for comm commercialism, but also like putting this stuff out there. Like what about the ownership? Um, there was one museum from New Zealand who has, uh, who works under a big policy of how to treat the, uh, the, the treasure. And that's really a heavily um, concept dealing with the biculturalism between New Zealand, you know, with the Maori, because they are most, you know, like the question is, if you're putting your data, your culture data out there, who owns it? But again, who actually really owns it originally? Like it's the community, right? So there is no one, like one specific person who's kind of like, I have a copyright on this. And there are some cases where uh, a modern time designer who, who, who try to commercialize this and they get a, um, a, a, a bad feedback or like a condemnation. Gucci a few times are doing this culture of appropriation. There's even this one ju famous jewelry maker designer. Um, I'm not sure if he's American or British, but he's based in Bali and he got his uh, work inspired by Balinese uh, aesthetics. And then he tried to copyright it. And these this got a lot of uh, backlash from the community, not just the Balinese community, but also from, from uh, the, the, the design community. It's, it's an ongoing um, concern, of course, okay? Then who owns it? Everyone, you know? I think, I think, I think uh, this is the, the, the spirit of, okay, we are sharing something, right? Um, uh, we are making something. There's this thing that I learned from Pachok, the, the indigo guy, and uh, my my boss in, uh, in Museum Kain, uh, the late Ronnie Siswandi. These are two creative men who has the concept of traditional motifs from Java and from Bali, and they create something contemporary that kind of like, it looks new, but it's, it's actually a combination of different kind of traditional methods. And they are not afraid that people trying to copy their work because when you copy, it's not, it's still not the original. You know what I mean? When you got a printed batik, it's still a different value than an original painted batik, right? And there will always be a difference between uh, the original and the copy. There's always a different value and you can, I, it's, it's, I mean, the more people like batik, we like it, okay? But when you talk about, um, well, actually between me and, and Sharon, maybe we will have a conversation about the ownership of batik between Indonesia and Malaysia. <laughs> but um, I mean, it's, it, I think a, 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 it's an ongoing conversation between what is a shared heritage and what is cultural appropriation, right? So, yeah, it's a really it's a really big concept. But once we are uh, we put our cultural data out there to kind of educate people, and we actually kind of lose our ownership. It's the same principle with Wikimedia. If you put your digital data from your museum on Wikimedia, and then the ownership of that data, you have to share it with the Wikipedia. If you want to change it and everything, you have to collaborate with them. It's that's I think that's the spirit of of sharing. 
Um, thank you so much, Anissa. And you really touched upon so many important points here, um, how a lot of this heritage is shared um, amongst uh, neighboring communities and even within the wider Southeast Asian region. Um, as Julia mentioned before, I mean, we even, uh, um, there was like one common plant between all of the countries of Southeast Asia, which was uh, Sobnat Merak, you know, uh, with all the different names and all the different local names. And, uh, and the importance of also sharing this knowledge within the community and with the wider world. And this is actually what the, um, why we're gonna make the publication on this research um, freely available for everyone to know and to use and to, and to practice. Uh, but I'll give more details on that later. Um, and so while you're still with us, I mean, uh, I just wanna ask you as a professional with experience in, Asia, in the Asia Pacific region, and now you are working in, uh, in the United Arab Emirates in the Middle East, um, and with your background, uh, so what do you think about Western mod models of conservation, which rely uh, kind of heavily on historical uh, listings and protective legislation, how realistic are they and applicable to the context of places like Asia or the Middle East? And I'm asking this uh, of course, uh, because of last week's panel where they actually talked about um, cultural heritage laws. Um, so yeah, do you think that these legislations and list listings are realistic to the context of the Asia Pacific region or should we be focusing more on adaptive reuse and putting cultural objects and knowledge to modern use for the sake of its re uh, revival and survival? Well, um, I think adaptation is is uh, it should should be a basic understanding when applying conservation anywhere, because I mean it's a fact that. Uh, conservation is a science that focus a lot about environment, right? If your environment change, what you're going to do changes because the object also react rea reacted differently to different environments. So I think it's 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 an easy it's an easy question. The easiest, okay. Thank you, Lynn. And uh, <laughs> uh, it's. Uh, uh, there is a notion that sometime from the global south countries that we have to copy 100% of um, the museum practice or culture conservation practice that is a, a, apply, being applied in the global north. But I don't think so. It's kind of impossible and it's actually torturing us. Like, now, as you can see, if you can see in the, in the map, the distribution map of the UNESCO World Heritage, most of them are from Europe, because the standard is based on Eurocentric, it's uh, based on Euro standard. It's, it's, it's difficult to apply um, a standard that uh, easily being done by, uh, by countries with higher GDP than the average GDP of countries from Southeast Asia or South America. It's, 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 kind, of, it's kind of ridiculous, I think. But basically that the, the, the understanding of conservation is how to adapt to different environments. So I think there is no one, uh, one monolithic um, answer for all problems. Um, uh, working on metals in, in the Netherlands could be a different kind of methods when you do it in a tropical uh, Malaysia. So we have to learn like continuously all the time, whenever the environment changes. Um, thank you so much, Anissa, for sharing your thoughts on uh, different conservation models and how we should really be expanding our, how we think and how we look at and how we practice uh, conservation today. And with that, I think um, this is a great way to kind of transition towards what Lillian is trying to do in, uh, in her research, uh, which we have connected between Southeast Asia and Central America, so like across across the Pacific. Um, so Lillian, thank you for joining us today. Um, you know, uh, your work has been so important to this research project and how it provides the scientific 
validation for these methods. So it would be great if you could tell us a bit about, um, about your work in general and how it applies to the field of conservation. Would you like me okay. to do your slides or would you like to do it yourself? Uh, do you, I can do it. <laughs> okay, I think great. I can share it, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. okay. So I'm going to try to share it. If, it, if something goes wrong, then I will need your help, Lynn. <laughs> okay, I'll be on standby if you need. But I think I can do it. <laughs> so, first of all, I'm really happy to be with you all. Thanks for having me here. It was amazing working with you all. So, uh, the first thing, um, this started because uh, for my doctorate studies, I researched traditional Mesoamerican materials derivated from plants from a scientific approach. And then I characterized, I characterized uh, molecules and compounds found on Mexican plants. And then I understood the importance of our biocultural heritage. And through science and a responsible collection, cultivation and caring of these materials that produce those plants, I understand that they needed to be um, researched and preserved. And that's when I, I met Julia, <laughs> then Lynn, Sia, and Anisia, and when I, uh, this laboratory came to exist. So this laboratory uh, was started with me and my colleague and friend, Marlene Samano. She specializes in built material. She studies lime and earth. And well, I am the plants lady. So um, in this laboratory, we know that we have a biocultural heritage, a legacy, a traditional technologies legacy, big, but it's uh, starting to be forgotten. And these are materials, mostly plants, that were used for making um, our cultural heritage. So. There are lots of people that are studying these plants, you know, uh, like orchids for glues or agave for saponins for soaps. But the thing is that the plants are not so used anymore and they are starting to become in some sad cases extinct. And in others, uh, they are delegated to make um, drinks and other things. So this laboratory was uh, arises from a need to develop teaching and research activities for the study and recovery of traditional technologies and for the development and the formulation of not toxic materials and the conservation of the Mexican biocultural and natural heritage. And we are guided under this sustainable perspective with an impact on social well being and trying to collaborate with educational institutions and the promotion of ecological and safe materials for restoration, the user and the environment. Because these plants provide a non-toxic alternative, and because if we don't value if we don't value these materials, we can't preserve the plants. So here is this. This is from one of the codex, and as you can see in the left, up left, uh, there's this plant, an agave, that was used for making uh, shampoo <laughs> and for cleaning clothes. It's uh, like the saponins in Southeast Asia. And in the, uh, in the right, you can see two women from Oaxaca cleaning graffitis from the church with these happenings. So it works, but we have a problem. We don't use it in restoration and conservation and textiles you, we use on other materials. So we need to say, hey, these materials can work, but to see if they can work, we need to have a protocol. We need to do a methodology, we need to take this methodology and make it in the lab so we can test if it works. So we did this in Thailand in a workshop, and then we did it again in Mexico, and we did all these um, tests so we could say, yes, this needs to be kept because it's ecological, it's non-toxic, it's part of our legacy, and it works. And yes, it works. So we collaborate with academics, biologists, botanists, anthropologists, and conservators with international institutions to expand this research because this is not just Mexico, it happens in Southeast Asia, it happens in all the world. And 
I think this is a global thing that we are losing this touch. And the more, you know, from the academy, we use what is modern, what is new, but we are not trying to look back. So to look back, we need to say, hey, science says you can turn back these works. And we have um, friends and the support of academies, academics from two universities, the UNAM, the Autonomous University of Mexico, and the Metropolitan Autonomous University. And we carry out lots of tests. We do colorimetry, we measure hydrogen potential, surface tension, solubility, weathering tests, simulation of climatic changes, tensile strength, yellowing tests, and gas chromatography. And we need to test this quality of the technologies and the products. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> and here is the thing. We did this test and we can say, yes, this works. This cleans. This, when you put this, um, all these textiles, and then you have a simulation of aging, <laughs> the, <laughs> the saponins perform better, the plants perform better than when we use that comes from the laboratory. So this is very important that we need to change our perspective and our, and our views on conservation materials. You see, in Mexico and in America, the use of secret recipe 300 patents and lab made synthetic materials, that's a common thing. If you hear that this comes from a very, um, you don't know what's the material of this thing. You don't know where this comes from, but it's very expensive. And the, the text in the, in the product is in English and you can't understand it, then you have to buy it. So that's what we, what we use. And what we were thought to use was anionic and non-ionic soaps. And these are detrimental to the environment. And we know that for sure. We know that we shouldn't be using this because our mother earth, you know, but we keep on using them. And now we know that we can use saponins because they are safe for the user, for our environment, and they are tried and they have been tested. And they are indeed an alternative for the conservation of a variety of materials. We started with textiles, but now we're doing also tests with uh, mural paintings and sculptures and other kinds of materials. So we are relearning. Really we are doing this because we are relearning from our ancestors. We were so maybe kind of blinded for the, well, I, I say for myself and my students and the, some academics. We were kind of blinded in this thing that if it's new, it's better. But maybe if we look back, we can find better alternatives and we have done that. And so at the same time, here is a one well, here is uh, for the workshops from the students when one of the pictures is one of my very beloved teachers she tell she taught me how to clean with um, uh, anionic uh, soaps and now she was in a workshop working with agave saponins and she was amazed and i was amazed and so happy that she was <laughs> glad <laughs> doing that and that she was looking that there are other options. So we can protect our environment. And by that, we can conserve our biocultural heritage and the wonderful, wonderful plants that are involved in this. So there's a little difference between, um, you know, Southeast Asia and Mexico, because here the plants don't, are not used for materials as much. You can see them and you watch them, but you don't know if they can be used or not. So we have this little museum, plant museum in the school. And we are, well, we're going to have another one, a bigger, prettier one, but now everything has been stopped. But we have um, agaves, orchids, uh, plants that, are work, that work for doing dyes. And some plants, they were like very little, as you can see with their small agave, they have grown now. Sorry for the picture. It is it's a, an earlier picture, but we are reproducing these plants and we are taking care of them. So if you use them, you have to keep them growing and then you protect them. And that's where, what we are trying to do. 
And we, ha we have these um, courses and these uh, talks. And what we want to say is these plants need to be protected because they make materials, materials that protect you and protect the environment. And this is worth it because it's our biocultural heritage. We need to protect our traditional technologies and we need to look at it from a scientific perspective so we can have a methodology to say, yes, this works. No, this doesn't work. And what we have done and the, also the plants that we research in our collaboration in Thailand, they work too. So we're very happy about it. And that's my work for now. That's what we do. And we are planning on growing, on testing more plants on more materials and I'm trying to change this view of the new materials versus the traditional ones. So this is it. <laughs> thank you all for having me here. Um, thank you so much, Lillian, for, uh, for sharing your work and um, how important it is for uh, um, for the survival of this knowledge and the environmental landscape and how we treat it because, you know, as you say, um, so clearly we, we source everything that we have and use from our landscape and from the environment. So we need to treat it well in return. And I'm, uh, what was really interesting was showing the picture of your professor um, who came to learn how to use agave saponins uh, as a cleaner. And here we see this process of like unlearning uh, Western methods, you would these museum grade cleaners that we're told are the best and cost X amount of money and all of that. So unlearning that and now relearning um, these, uh, these methods that are, that were, the, that, were grown, that were grown in our own garden, in our own environment and practiced by our, by our ancestors. Um, so this is a, a great um, example of, of, uh, of uh, unlearning and relearning. And so, um, and so we come up with these effective and less invasive solutions. Um, and so how, how do you think, uh, what is the future, the place of these methods in scholarship? How do you see the future of these indigenous methods in uh, scholarship and professional, uh, professional practice? I see a great future because when we started, I mean, just Julia came to, to ask me what was I doing. And then, I mean, in, in Mexico and in America, it was like, oh, it's kind of cute, but let's stay there, you know? And then I saw in Southeast Asia that it was more like, more common to be in touch with these traditional technologies and with this heritage. So, when I came back and when I talked with one of my colleagues, I said, what, what do we do to make this kind of work again, to try with the people? And she told me through students, you need to do it through students because in a community, if you go and say, you should start using this. And I, I have been in communities and they say like, yes, but it's um, too much hustle. And they like more the, the things that are new. And I can understand that because new sounds better always, you see? And uh, from another country, it sounds even better. <laughs> so this is a hard thing, but if you go through students, it's a change. They, they are younger, they, kind of, they have this um, thirst for knowledge and they have these new students, they really appreciate our traditions. And so I think that this link and they, don't go to teach them how to use their traditions. No, they go and they learn from them to use these traditions. They have more respect than we older uh, teachers because they are really respectful for the traditions. They want to know what they did, how, and they don't go with this idea of, I'm going to teach you how to do your traditions, you know? It's like, please teach me, I can use it in school or in the academy. And that's a very impressive thing. I, I'm very proud of my students. And I think this is a new thing uh, or new generations so that they are starting to look back with all and uh, with and wanting to learn and not teach. And I really like that. 
I feel very happy about them, <laughs> hopeful. Well, I think this is great how actually this uh, knowledge from our ancestors is being, uh, how, how you see the future of it uh, in your, in your uh, community of students. So how it's these uh, young students who, are at, who actually show interest in it and who are fostering it, cultivating it. Um, so, so what has your community of students been, um, the, been doing in the work? How have they been participating in this? Uh, now I have, um, one of my students did a great protocol on cleaning. And I said, do you need to clean? Do you not need to clean? And he tried mostly in a community of conservators <laughs> that are very, very pro, pro cleaning. And one other of my students is doing, um, I really like what she's doing. She's working with um, communities in Oaxaca. You saw that this woman that, that seal clean with uh, saponins. So she's working with communities and she's trying to make a um, workshop so they can tell the architects that work with these big buildings to say, hey, stop, because they are using uh, toxic um, soaps, toxic synthetic soaps. So she's trying to do these workshops with these women and with these architects, big architects, to say, hey, there's another way of doing it. Of course, it has to be, we need to test them, we need to say, yes, it works, and we need to have a, a protocol an integrated protocol so she can say, hey, this is a good protocol, this can work, let's try something new. And the other thing is that we are doing, you remember what we did in, in Thailand that we clean uh, cotton and silk with the saponins, we are doing more cleaning tests and we are testing how they work before and after aging them. So we can say if it works or it doesn't work, and okay, this is... Mm. I'm going ahead because this is not polished yet, but it works. It works better in some cases. And well, the other thing that we are doing, we are doing these talks and trying to make papers and trying from the academia to be heard. Yes, share, sharing the knowledge is key here. And I'll, I'll actually move over yes. to Julia, who actually works uh, extensively in, um, in education for conservation. So please go ahead, Julia. Um, Lillian, Lillian's work from the scientific end um, is the absolutely the full circle because really truly conservation is the bringing together and the preservation of, of textiles in this case is the coming together of science and um, culture and material culture and um, the traditional knowledge and so you've made a full circle because it's actually quite difficult to say, oh, I really, really do think that using soap nut and ledoc and these things are better. And, and really the result looks fabulous. And anyway, all the Nyonya and, and all the elders say that it works better. But in our own field, we actually have to quantify it. We have to analyze it. We have to show that it hasn't been destructive or that the pH is, is an acceptable pH. And so this kind of quantifying is so important. And what you're doing, which is spreading that information out through action through your students and in our, in our workshop, doing the testing together and spreading that knowledge back out into museum environment like Shaw's Museum and where Anissa worked and many other people that were involved in this project. It took that, that you know, ancestral knowledge, quantified it, and then put it back out there with the actual um, people who were doing the research. And now with publications and with, with our publication, it's so important because we, we're actually up against a, a very big force that says, um, you, you can't use those goofy little plant things. Um, you know, that's kind of silly. Um, so I, I'm, it's really the perfect union. We, we couldn't have done all of this work actually without Lillian. <laughs> so really fortunate to have an amazing scientist oh, thank you. that can thank you. work with us and quantify this. Thank you. This was really amazing working with you all. 
Uh, thank you so much, Julia. Thank you so much, Lillian. Um, and actually, um, we uh, speaking of all the, the plans and the scientific validation, uh, because we had a glitch with the, with the slides earlier, maybe we can show our viewers uh, some, some of the things that, that we missed in, in, the, in the previous slide, just to give an example of all these plants and how they can be used. Um, so hopefully you can see my screen now this time. Yep, and you yep. can go down, yeah, yep. Yeah, so I believe we, we showed this earlier, uh, Shah, um, uh, Shah who talked to us about smoking the textile and this is done in Indo Indonesia. Again, shared heritage, shared knowledge and methods. So among the 62 plants identified, um, Soap nut was identified as a common saponin surfactant. Uh, Lillian mentioned agave in Mexico. Um, you can use rice stock or coconut frond ash as a bleaching agent. And just even from your common kitchen, you can use rinsed rice water and coconut water as a cleaner for silks. Uh, side note, uh, soap nut is also great for shampoo. Uh, rinsed rice water is also great as a facial cleanser. And also from like many gardens in Southeast Asia, you can use betel leaf as a stain remover and, and pest repellent. So that's an example of like a plant having two different kinds of uses. Um, they can also be used in, uh, in treatments. So uh, for example, you can use tea to revive batik color. You can use uh, butterfly pea, which gives off this blue tint that will intensify your, white, your, your whites. Um, Sorry, here, here we go. And then um, on the other side of the spectrum is storage, which are actually made from plants. So you can use uh, bat baskets made from traditional fibers that provide light control and well-ventilated storage to actually preserve your, preserve your textiles. And I'd also like to share with everybody uh, Shah's wonderful drawings from his field research. <laughs> So here you have the chicken trap, and here you also have how um, uh, sonket is, uh, is stretched when it's drying so that the threads don't get bent. And you also have uh, Burmese tanaka, which is uh, traditional in Myanmar um, as a cosmetic product and sun repellent has a variety of uses. Um, and it's used, is recorded in Myanmar as being used as a stain remover and you, um, you know, our researcher, uh, Aimee Zine, who uh, works at, with the museum in Myanmar, she tried it and it works. Uh, it's incredible. And then here we have a photo of a peacock feather. Um, Julia, maybe you could tell us a bit more about the peacock feather story. <laughs> Actually, it's Shaw's peacock feather. <laughs> I believe, Shaw, you um, discovered this method and one of your informants told you that if you put the peacock feather uh, in the container, the drawer, the repository with the textile, yes. because of the construction of the bug's eyes, they see the peacock eye as so enormous and they get scared and they run away. Uh, okay, I, I get our opinion from entomologists from our uh, National uh, Historic history Museum that uh, peacock's uh, colors can attract the eyes and they keep away the the ants actually, and then it, it destroys the other 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 pests to 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 go to the textile and to put a peacock. Uh, uh, I I got I try once, but yes, it's really it's really words. It's really was nature. Nature uh, really give to us to 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 follow. Us. Then uh, yeah, it's 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 a it's a gift. <laughs> it's marvelous. Um, I just want to make a comment about the sonket. Sonket is a, a type of uh, textile in um, Southeast Asia and Indonesia, Malaysia. But one of its characteristics is it's often silk with metallic thread. And one of the things that we heard over and over again from, from owners and from custodians and people that own Songket is that you cannot clean them. You cannot get them wet because the metallic threads will unravel, they'll swell up, um, and it destroys them. And this goes back also to even Anissa saying, oh, just let the sweat stay on it. It leaves a nice patina and deepens the color. But um, the, the whole method of, of smoking 
or perfuming is, is a kind of method of dry cleaning that's actually, it's so appropriate for caring for textiles. It's such a safe path if it's done correctly to infuse smoke into textiles that normally are, are, are stored, folded up in very tropical climate and they get mildewed and moldy very easily. And so by laying them out and infusing them with this myriad of herbs um, actually is a disinfectant, um, it kills bacteria, it dries them out, and then it perfumes them. And so it's, it's, um, it's a perfect conservation solution that none of us were aware of that could actually enter into um, the pantheon of conser textile conservation practice. Um, thank you, Julia. And again, to go back to the slides that we couldn't see earlier due to the glitch. Um, um, so here are some photos of the elders that we um, interviewed for the project. So uh, we have um, Elder Subi Nalan. Um, they're she's transmitting knowledge to her, her daughter in uh, producing and caring for abaca cloth in uh, Mindanao in the Philippines. Here is our researcher in, uh, in Laos, Vien Kham with uh, Weaver Vendera. And there is myself uh, when we were conducting our preliminary research uh, with QSMT, the Queen Circuit Museum of Textiles in Prague. Uh, now, we've just shown a few of the 62 plants um, that were identified in this project. And we have quite a few questions um, from the audience as to which plant can be used for what. And in the interest of time, uh, I would just like to tell the viewers that Actually, all of this research has been compiled and is going to be published in an upcoming uh, publication that will be available for download for free. Uh, uh, so the actual physical copies are going to be printed in a couple of weeks and the digital version is going to be launched online shortly thereafter. Um, so stay tuned on the CMEO SPAFA Facebook page and website when it's gonna be launched and all of, all of you with questions out there um, can, um, can consult uh, this resource. It will have a database, it will have recipes for everyone to use. And we also wanna see it as a participatory endeavor. So we actually invite you to, to write to us, to, uh, to write to the organizers. All of our emails would be included. Drop us a message on Facebook if you know of a method that should be included in there to, to expand it. We don't see this research as something that is closed and done, but as something, as a starting point to, to know more. Um, and, uh, and also as Anissa said, as Lillian said, we also, you know, sharing it with the wider world. Um, so I hope that addresses some of the, the questions here. Um, I would like to actually uh, try to um, uh, well, what's, you know, sum, summarize kind of what, we, uh, what we've been talking about here and what we've been trying to, to do with this research and to jo just show some closing images here. So in, um, in this research, uh, what was really exciting was how um, local scholars and practitioners were engaged uh, with communities as the sources and owners of knowledge and how to embrace the materials from your landscape and to use them. Um, a, a very fun part, endearing part, was gathering and sharing stories and histories with uh, people, um, elders and young people. Here we've had people from all different walks of life, young, old, from different backgrounds, um, in the aim to develop these uh, locally tailored preservation models. And in so doing, it's really um, touching upon all of these different fields, uh, intangible cultural heritage, material culture on the one hand, and uh, bio and natural heritage, uh, which is going to ultimately you know, help to preserve our landscape and environment. And so we were, we're going back to what Anissa was saying about you know, ecosystems and regenerative cycles, and also what Lillian's community of students um, are trying to do. Um, and so a bit more about um, the publication. So we'll also have these, uh, these posters. I have some in print here <laughs> um, that, you that you guys can put up that will come with the hard copy of the book. 
Um, and so the, the, this idea actually came from uh, one of the people involved in the project, Pete Cry from the commu uh, Indigo community of Prey. Uh, when we had the regional forum and we asked, okay, so we're collecting this knowledge. We're all here now. How do we uh, share this knowledge? And um, Pete Cry's idea, uh, it was Pete Cry's idea to produce these posters um, with his dream being to put them up in schools and community centers so that these can be used for um, school projects, whether they're uh, chemistry projects, science projects, cultural studies, um, and, and things like that, or even just having them up in a, in a community center in the village um, so that people can actually think about uh, other plants that they, that they have available. Um, so, uh, and then this was actually designed uh, by Anissa's friends in Indonesia. <laughs> so we, we actually like, you know, used a network of family and friends in every, every part of this project, which was really, which was really fun. And I'd like to end um, with uh, the story of Nong Nut, who we met in Freya, who I think just like, um, um, the community of indigo, di uh, 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 indigo in Bali and Lillian's community of students really show the promising future of indigenous knowledge. Now, what's so interesting about the story of Nut, I mean, he uh, is an example of how human ingenuity works with the landscape and how traditional technology can meet with modern technologies. Um, what happened was he, he went to a temple fair and saw someone using a traditional loom and he thought, oh, I like that. He went home and with the help of his father, he built his own loom. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite incredible. And so not only did he build his own loom, he uh, actually, um, to, to, to spin the cotton, he puts it on a bicycle and through the spinning action, he uses it to recharge his rechargeable, uh, his rechargeable batteries. And uh, in, his, uh, in his adventures in weaving, he also decided to go into diving and uh, went and uh, did his own uh, survey of plants in the landscape to find his own uh, traditional dyes. So one of the pictures that you see here is what he calls his office. So it's his office in the rice field where he tries all of these different dyes uh, from the landscape. So here you have a, a young man who's doing his uh, military, his 17 year old boy doing his military training, who's weaving, recharging his batteries while spinning, um, you know, dying in, a, in the rice field. And he actually keeps a collection of his, um, of um, samples of all these dyes. So he remembers, uh, you know, which plant uh, produces which dye. Um, so on, um, uh, it, it's just such an incredible story to, to share the story of uh, Nong Nut. I'm sure Julia will never forget um, <laughs> meeting him. <laughs> um, and uh, so on, um, and this really ties in also with, with Shah's family in Kelantan, how they were an invaluable resource in all of this. Um, I think we have a, you know, a promising future for this uh, indigenous knowledge, thanks to these young people as, uh, as Lillian was saying. Um, and uh, I think that's pretty much uh, uh, it for now, but actually, you know, I just remembered there was a question that was sent uh, via UCLA from the Philippines from an ethnographic museum from Orlando, uh, which I, I'm gonna uh, direct towards Lillian, um, saying that in the Philippines, there is difficulty in sourcing non-ionic detergents to wash textiles. So what do you recommend as a substitute? Yes. <laughs> yeah, and, and I want to ask another question very, it has to do with this one. Um, the thing about um, saponins is that they work a little bit better for polar stains. So when you treat grease, yes, of course, you know, non-ionic and anionic uh, soaps, they are great because they do take all the grease out. So when you search for a cleaning agent and it says it cleans even when it's cold, or you can see, you know, even in washing dishes uh, ads that you, you put a drop and the grease goes away, well, that soap is going to go to the drain and it's going to make great damage to the environment. So yeah, maybe the saponins don't work as 
good for cleaning grease stains. That would be the, uh, I wouldn't say that's a disadvantage because that means they are not going to pollute the environment. So maybe you have to deal with a little bit of patients cleaning or acknowledging that maybe some grease stains are going to be there forever. But it's a price that I think we are willing to kind of pay. And even if you have to clean a grease stain that is, that is very, very stain, staining the textile, you're going to make more damage trying to take it away. That's one. And the other thing is, yes, in Philippines, you have uh, this uh, cecidium that's called uh, fruit. It's the jambul and the jambo, they call it. It's um, this plant and it has lots of saponins. So this fruit, if you dry the fruit and then you process it, you can take the saponins. So you can clean with saponins. And another thing, another, um, you can also use the Castile soap. You know, Castile soap, it's good for the environment, but it's very, very basic. It has an 8.5, almost 9 pH. So you can only use it for cotton. You couldn't use it or, or for linen. You can't use it for silk or for wool. So for silk and wool, you need to use uh, acidic pH because that's the pH of the wool and the silk. So you should use a saponin. It would be a great alternative and you have saponins, very good saponins. So I think uh, you can use this cecidium uh, uh, species, you can dry them and we, I can give you uh, more information as how you can take them and prepare them and use it. And you can also find saponins online. You can buy saponins from agave, from lerac, in dust, because they, they are still used. You can find them. So you can use saponins for silks and um, wools, and you can use this Castile soap for cotton and linen. And these are very, very non-toxic alternatives, safe alternatives, and they can work. Thank you so much, Lillian, for uh, addressing this very specific question. Um, as for the other questions, as I said, please revert to the publication that's going to come out um, because the uh, different plants will um, be used to treat different fibers. So I've seen a few questions on abaca cloth, on banana fibers. So you will find all of that there. If you do not find it there, maybe go into the community and find out more. Yeah. And, and add to this wealth of knowledge. Um, so um, uh, I think we're running out of time now, but thank I would like to thank our panelists. Thank you, Anissa. Thank you, Shaw, Lillian, Julia. Thank you to uh, Maddie, Daiwei, Stephen, and to our friends at UCLA for giving us the opportunity to, to share our research. Thank you, everyone. This is a very informative discussion. So the panel highlights the importance of local and indigenous knowledge systems in the conservation of cultural materials. The discussions also reinforce what this webinar series has stressed, that engaging communities results in a sustainable and meaningful conservation uh, programs, heritage, or uh, in time, both intangible and, and uh, tangible heritage. And as Julia mentioned, and, and the panel stressed this, the scientific process and indigenous knowledge complement each other. They're not uh, contradictory. The panel also stressed that heritage is more often than not impacted by economic forces. The techniques discussed have also opened discussions about authenticity and context. It is admirable that we, that we are documenting these methods because of the dangers brought by modernity. But we also have to be cognizant of the fact that indigenous cultures and indigenous knowledge systems and their technologies are dynamic as the panel discussion has underscored. But perhaps one of the key themes that we have to be always aware of, especially among us who work directly with communities, is the impact that you bring into the communities that you work with. It is a fact that traditional textile around the world have cultural meanings and that certain weaves are reserved only for specific occasions or particular individuals. 
However, there have been a lot of cultural appropriations around the world where entrepreneurs co-opt the design of indigenous peoples without providing any compensation to the latter. It is in the sense that communities should be able to reap the benefits of their own technology and design. It has been said that a thin line separates a spectacle and heritage conservation. We argue that the line is blurred because indigenous peoples are making their history. They're making decisions that matter to them. Thus, they are producing new knowledge. So I guess that's just uh, to link all the conversations into the, the wider, the broader um, goals of this, this webinar series. So with that, um, thank you everyone. Um, we invite you for our last panel next week, which will tie all of our discussions from panel one to, to panel nine into something that's more um, uh, applied. How do we move forward? How do we move, make what we do uh, meaningful and also uh, something that communities can, can use? So thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everyone, or good evening to all. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Shah, Anissa, Lillian, Stephen, everyone at UCLA.